This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Says I just your ass. This is my You're gonna acknowledge me. Hello everybody and welcome to something new. Welcome to something fresh. Welcome to Wrestle Magic here on the WWE Podcast, where we are local, we are stateside, and we are international. I am your co-host Rocky T here with the man to tell you what Wrestle Magic is all about, the second best wrestling podcaster in Louisville, the gardener, Mr. Michael Gross. What's going on? Not a whole lot, man. Just surviving like crazy weather that we've had here and all kinds of crazy schizophrenic uh, things that are happening in Louisville between car accidents and uh, buildings burning down. At least I'm holding it together so we can put together this beautiful new show that people have not heard or know anything about. So can I expand on that a little bit? Uh, Please tell everybody what this is all about and why we're here. So – you and I became friends uh, a few weeks back. Uh, you mm-hmm. commented on a show that I had done with Matt, and um, I was looking to have my own show, and Matt had granted me that time slot, uh, which is never on a clock, folks. So it's not going to be weekly. It's just going to be sporadic. Um, and I've been looking for a co-host, and you and I seem to have built some chemistry up, and we've been talking about different things. And we both agree that a lot of people – do the same kind of shows there's a lot of uh reviews recaps um right but nobody is talking about what's not being talked about that's in pro wrestling today so i started picking your brain and you started picking my brain and we started coming up with ideas and topics about things that should be covered but no one's really doing it so who's better than the two of us i mean come on that's true as a historian myself and finding out that you were one that's what it really clicked off um, us two. So whenever you brought this topic to me that we're about to talk about, I I was just so excited to take the challenge on and do the homework that you gave me. And you said we're going to record in a couple of days, so get it done. And it was it was so much fun. So before we tell everybody what we're talking about, please tell them what Wrestle Magic is and where it comes from. So when I was 16 years old, uh, my family didn't have a whole lot of money, but I remember my my birthday was coming up. And so I asked my my parents what I was getting for my birthday. And of course, they're not going to tell you. But um, my mother said, God rest her soul. um, I can't tell you, but it has something to do with wrestling. And my older sister said, come on, we don't have a whole lot of money. What do you think it is? I said, I don't know. And I said, hopefully it's tickets to a WW at that time F event that was coming up close. And she said, no, it's probably something lame, like a T-shirt that says Wrestle Magic. And my younger brother said, no, you got to say that right with like a little disco fuck. It's like, Wrestle Magic. <laughs> and it became a running joke through my family for many years, the, the Wrestle Magic t-shirt, which hopefully soon will be available, but we'll get to that towards the end of the show. So that's how Wrestle Magic came about, uh, the name. And when I was thinking about Matt, when he granted me time to create content, what I was going to call the show, it just, I, I was thinking like, what do I call it? This wrestling, that wrestling, what, what, what shows are trademarked, you know? Um, right. You know, could it be into the garden with the gardener? Well, I don't want it to be too selfish, you know. And then I was like, I need something magical. And then all of a sudden it clicked. And uh, on a side note, when I came up with the name, I called my sister. And I said, uh, I think I know what I'm going to call my segment. And she's like, what? And I told her how I went through this in my brain. I said, then I just wanted something magical. And she just stopped. She goes, it's Wrestle Magic, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) knew. Uh, the, yeah, whenever you told me the name of the show, I, I loved it in, in, instantly. Uh, so many things popped off my head about, you know, when you show me the logo, and I'm thinking of different color schemes and different ways just to make it roll off the tongue. And so, with that being said, let's go ahead and start. Let everybody know what the topic is for this first episode. So, I think it's a great crime 
to everybody out there in America who's never been exposed to one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time who's retiring this year. And that man is the one and only great Muda, Kihai Muto. This man's career has lasted 30 years, I believe. Um, he is an incredible performer, an innovator, and a man who has influenced so many wrestlers, but never gets the credit for it. And the popular belief is that he's going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And yet people have not been exposed to him or don't, don't know anything about him. So we are going to educate and expose him to the masses today. Yeah, so you're right whenever you say the masses don't know about him because I've been a wrestling fan for 30 plus years. And I know I've heard the, the name before. I did see the return to AEW when he came back to save Sting. But when you told me, do you know his history? And my answer was no. And you told me to do my homework. I had so much fun learning about this guy. As soon as we hung up the phone that afternoon, I, I read up on him, started watching videos on him. And what I could find on him just I, I was educated so much and I fell in love with this guy. This guy could be on anybody's Mount Rushmore. That's you know, absolutely like I said, true. Anybody. Yeah. Absolutely um, true. You know, it, it's it's interesting because you looked at him and you and I made a really good point when we were talking and doing homework. When you watch his matches, do you believe even his matches from the late eighties, early nineties would stand up for today's critic? Now they do. And that's coming from, again, a 30-plus fan. I try to put myself back in a time period whenever, you know, the late 80s and 90s. And the moves that he did, you know, we weren't used to seeing them. They weren't total flip-flop, you know, like on and on and on. But he has those high spots. I know for a fact that hold up today because the matches I saw with Dick Murdoch, Arn Anderson, the the best the match, matches he had with Sting, they, they do hold up. So it's it's insane to me to think that we had a man who helped influence and um, come up with some of the greatest high spots ever. But yet he he didn't have to um, do a million dives out outside of the ring or use furniture all the time. But he did use something else. Is that and he well, that was the mood of mist. So mist. the mist, it's 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 iconic. Um, and while he wasn't the first person to do it. He was the person to popularize it and make it more of an Americanized thing. What was your thought on The Mist? So I've seen The Mist over the years, um, Tajiri, of course, Oscar. But when I saw him use it, there was something different about it. I don't know if it's because he didn't speak the language or it was the face paint or maybe just because I was just learning about him. And I was just in awe with with his moveset and his in-ring ability. When he used it, it just seemed superior to the way today's wrestlers use it. Um, like you said, he wasn't the first to use it. Kabuki was said to be the first one to use it. It's got a 40-year-plus history. Um, do you know how the mist, where it comes from, like how they actually get it in the mouth? You know, I've, I've been trying to figure that one out for years. Now, obviously, uh, when Muda wrestled, it was seamless. So he could take a powder, go outside the ring, maybe duck his head under the ring apron and pop it in his mouth. Um, part of his whole mystique was the fact that when he came out, his fingers would tremble. Now, my personal thought is that he would have like little gelatin packs maybe in his finger tape. And then because the finger tremble, you wouldn't think about him using his hands as much. It, kind of like a distraction piece, okay? So he could pop it in his mouth. Now, what made his mist so much better and so different from Kabuki and some of the few that used it before him was the fact that he would use two different color mists in a match. Red that blew my and mind. Green. Red, red and green. And what do you know the significances? I actually do. So yeah. green impairs the vision. Red has a burning effect. Now, I didn't know that there was a yellow one out there. Have you seen the yellow mist? Never seen the yellow mist. Never. So, I don't. again, I don't know who uses it, but yellow mist, because I did my research, has a paralyzing effect. There's the blue mist that I have seen once or twice that has an opiate effect. And then besides the green and the red, I've seen the black mist many times. And that's said to blind the victims for weeks on end, not just for that particular match or just for a day, but for weeks. 
And um, of course, you know, we had people like Gangrel that would use like a blood mist. And, you know, on, on a more sillier note, Cornswoggle had Celtic green fog. But again, that's just green mist. So, yeah, it's horns. <laughs> All right, so let's let's start with the beginning of Muda's career. So I believe he was trained by Hiro Matsuda. Now, mm-hmm. in his training class, he came up with his greatest rival, the person that he's always going to be synonymous with, which is Masahiro Chono. Masahiro Chono played the role of a Japanese Yakuza mafia lord. Uh, the two of them have had battles and then yet also fought side by side. They're also part of a famous faction in WCW history, but we'll get to that. And in their training class was another guy, a guy that has always been tied to Muda because of his influence, and that was Jushin Thunder Liger, who is already in the WWE Hall of Fame but never really got to be inducted properly because of COVID. So when you look at the class that they had, you had three complete all-stars of life, three Hall of Famers that, that came up together and took wrestling incredibly seriously. Um, but when Muda came to America, it was something different. Nobody knew what to expect. So the first time I was exposed to him, uh, I had seen him once or twice on either USWA or Continental. I think it was Continental back in the day. And he was, I think, the White Ninja. And I didn't know. I was like, okay, this guy's good. He's crisp. But, you know, I was like 10, 12, whatever. And while he was awesome, there was no fanfare. There was no flair. There was no – you had the sweet, but you didn't have the savory. So it was like, okay, this guy's cool. Now, flash forward, I'm about 13, 14 years old, probably 14. And I'm watching NWA, which later became WCW, Saturday night. And Gary Hart comes out and he says he has his new JTEX Corporation. Japan meets Texas. And he's got Terry Funk, who I'm already a fan of. It's the Funker, you know? Yeah. And they bring out this hooded figure. And I'm like, okay, looks cool. Maybe it's great Kabuki. And they pull off the hood and I'm like, that's not Kabuki. Who is this guy? His face is painted. He's wearing martial arts gi with some some emblems on the side, some katakanje, I think it's called. Um, And all of a sudden, I see him wrestle. And I stop dead in my tracks. I'd never seen anything like it. And Muda would not use the mist on enhancement talent. That was something we had to wait for, which made it that much more special. But right. they were putting in these matches against these Mario Mancinis and Pat O'Connors and not Pat O'Connor, but, uh, you know, the, these ethnic types and everything. And he's just barrel rolling through them. And he's using moves I've never seen before. Now, what moves when you did your homework really got you? So right off the bat, like I said, I'm doing my homework on this guy and uncovering him for me was like being a fan a kid in japan for 30 years and you never really know about sting you've heard the name once or twice you may see him pop up for a match here and there but you don't know who this guy is and then as a 30 year old man some somebody's telling you hey who's Sting?" and you don't know so that's how i felt kind of like if you were a marvel fan all your life and then you're discovering batman for the first time uh this guy's you know, he's dubbed one of the greatest wrestlers ever to come out of Japan. Uh, he's the mercy of the sea. Superb striker. I love his striking ability. Uh, this guy's the, the Bruce Lee of wrestling. And like like you said to the point about his, his ring gear. Awesome ring gear. His, his master is so unique. They're, they're so bad to the bone. Um, I really like the handspring flying elbow into the corner. Dear Lord. And then, and then he, he's got that, that low arcing, snapping moonsault, which hadn't been seen in America until he brought it here. Uh, what, what do you think about, about the, that? the uh, dragon screw leg whip? I've always been a fan of that move. Uh, I didn't know he made it popular. And I didn't know that Shiny Wizard was something that, you know, he pioneered as well, along with the Muda Lock. And, of course, he made the Miss popular, like we just talked about. His, his influence, which we can get to in a little bit, was was just incredibly amazing because... I mean, obviously, Tajiri, Asuka, um, countless people. There's been countless wrestlers who have tried to imitate 
um, what Muda did, but Muda did it different because we're going to go back to 89. I believe it was 89.90 when I first got exposed to him. Okay. And they did something different with him because um, Muda's, Muda was not an incredibly huge guy. He was like six one six two, and maybe 225, 230. But they had him going against two wrestlers at a time. Now, if you really want to get someone over, you do that with a big man. You don't do it with a smaller guy. But his impact, his pace, everything that he could do in that ring dictated that he could get over on two normal size enhancement talents instead of being somebody the size of the Undertaker, who he actually gets compared to. He's the Japanese version of the Undertaker. Yeah, and that's He's, part of what kind of connected me with Muda is because, like you said, six six one, six two, two twenty five. That's my build, you know. So that's what's part of what really get, like gets me with him is that if I ever wanted to be a wrestler, you know, and I could be as athletic as him, you know, I could have maybe, you know, shown up like that, the way he did. Absolutely. And so let me ask you something. What did you enjoy most about his first run, and what did you not enjoy about his first run? Hmm. Well, as you know, we're talking about Muda being in the States, and that's when he, de- he debuted that gimmick in 89. And okay. he debuted in NWA's World Championship Wrestling with his manager, Gary Hart. Um, he actually did his actual wrestling debut was in 84 as Muto. So yes. between 84, 84 and 88, he would have success in Japan winning you know, championships. And then his first excursion in 85, where he wrestled as a white angel, like you talked about, he also won championships here. He wins the NWA Florida heavyweight title and NWA Southern Eastern United States junior heavyweight title. What I enjoyed most is that this guy, in his first three years, he wins three different titles and three different promotions. So off the bat, he's already poised to have a Hall of Fame legendary career if he could just keep up the pace, which he does, which we'll get to all that here later in the podcast. So just just learning about him, I tried to get as much video as I could back from the early days, but it's hard to find that stuff. It, it is very hard to find a lot of that stuff. Uh, that was tra- uh, tape trading era, which was difficult because, I mean, you're a little bit younger than me, but growing up when we did back when there was only one corded phone in the house and your televisions were big boxes, uh, you only were limited to what you had beamed into your television as far as uh, antennas and cable. And I, I was lucky because I grew up in Cleveland that – we had such bad winters. We got a lot of wrestling programs because it was just easy for it to be syndicated. And so I got blessed to be exposed to Muda. Whereas um, a lot of people who were in the WWE universe and uh, only watched WWE because that's where they grew up or because Vince bought out the time slots of all the territories didn't get to be exposed to somebody who was one of the greatest in-ring performers of all time. So, um, Muda's first run, he was feuding with, I believe it was the Four Horsemen, if I'm not correct, and it was JTEX versus the Four Horsemen and Sting, and um, it was it was crazy because Sting had only been out for a couple of years. I remember him from the UWF buyout and merger, and uh, he was not very good at first, but then he got really, really, really good, and so we're in the the beginning of his prime the beginning of the, the, the prime part of his run. And the work he's doing was was really, really great. It was Russell Magic. And then you bring Certainly. in somebody you bring in somebody as polarizing and as captivating as the great Muda. And the first time Gary Hart took that cowl off of him and I saw that painted face and I saw what he can do. I was like, son of a fish. This guy is <laughs> this guy is an assassin. And that's the way they marketed him. Now, what we didn't know is that he had another persona as himself, Kihai Mudo. But that is part of when he went back to Japan. Now, for me, the first run was so special and so awesome because I was awestruck. Every wrestling fan I know from that time period was awestruck by him. Because you you carbon copy over to WWE at that time. It was 
Hulk Hogan garbage wrestling. Uh, you know, it was right before the whole everybody had to have an occupation. You know, so gimmicks. It, it was the gimmicks. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was gimmicky and all. You know, America. And if you were foreign and you came in, you didn't get pushed, or you got fed to Hogan. Whereas over here, we've got a guy that we think is a legit threat to Sting. He's a legit threat to Flair, and being paired with Terry Funk, who had so much NWA history, and Gary Hart being – a lot of people don't know this, but Gary Hart mimicked Anton LaVey. Do you know who that is? No. Anton LaVey is the guy who wrote the Satanic Bible, and they looked eerily alike. That's why it was easy for Gary Hart to be so evil-looking and, and – and, at that time, like Anton LaVey had been on television shows and, and talked about the Satanic Bible and things like that. So you have somebody who mimics it. It makes it that much more um, must-see TV. Is that why that Gary is- Hart – is that why Gary Hart never wanted Mudro to become babyface because then he would lose his job as the heel manager? That's absolutely correct. Uh, <laughs> Muda had gotten over so much in this area because of his work ethic and everything he was doing. People weren't booing him, even though he was the heel. People couldn't wait to see him. People were captivated. He was he was putting asses in seats a long time before that term was coined. And it, it's just because he would put on a great match, even if he was going against two enhancements or if he was going against Sting. If he was going against a primetime main event wrestler, you were getting must-see TV, obviously. But the fact that he was just so incredibly encapsulating – you couldn't take your eyeballs off the TV. He was the Undertaker of Japan. He, I mean, you remember the first time you saw the Undertaker? It's just like, wow, like this guy is drawing me in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, take and your so eyes off it. Yeah, work ethic went well above, and they did the same thing with Taker. They turned him face, but Gary Hart served as his advocate. Now I don't know how much uh, English that that Muda actually speaks. But I believe that, that Gary Hart was taking care of him as far as like being a manager semi in full life. And so Gary Hart knew that if Muda goes face, then Gary Hart has to go away. Yeah. And I've thought about this. So what would have happened? Would Muda have become K High Mudo in, in America? No. And here's another thing. I've never seen K High Mudo wrestle in America. I've only seen the great Muda. That's why it's hard to find it videos on him because what i can find is all it's all muto not muto i i find little doc- docuseries with stills um about muto but as far as wrestling matches especially full-length matches i mean it's hard hard to find them it, it's it's insane like how much you can dig through youtube and find all kinds of crazy stuff you can still find footage of the first time the undertaker came out at the royal rumble when he was kane the undertaker i watched that live and then it WWE edited it out, but I can still find that, like on Daily Motion and YouTube, but I can't find Muda wrestling in America as Muto. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, it is. So circling back to his early success, in 86, he returns to Japan and he debuts the Space Lone Wolf character. And oh, then in 87, in 87, he wins the IWGP tag titles. Okay. Um, do you know who he won the, the tag titles with? Oh, Koshinata. Did I okay. say that right? I, I Better than me. You know my Close stutter. enough. So, I'm, yeah, trying to exactly. bre- I'm trying to learn these guys' names, but yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It, it's difficult. I mean, it's it, we mean no disrespect, and it's not supposed to be like a racial thing. It's just so, some of the names are hard to pronounce. Um, so Muda, at, at this point, like I wasn't exposed to him. But this guy is just barrel rolling through talent, and he's making a bigger and bigger draw for himself. And there's very few people who can reinvent themselves and and do what he'd done at this time. So going forward, what was the next step in his career? It was WCW, uh, NWA, right. JTEX Corporation, which we were just t- talking about. But then because he was – as polarizing and and had so much fanfare for a a heel um, and Gary Hart's basic resistance to turning him into a face, um, Muda decided it was time to go back to Japan. 
but they did it in the most unceremoniously fashion. They treated him incredibly bad. They they did a pay per view, um, and this is the Kip Fry, Jim Hurd years, Bill Watts. It was a revolving door of general managers who were terrible at what they did, to be honest. And look, I'm a Bill Watts fan, but he didn't want you guys to use the top rope. Or if you went over the top rope, it was a disqualification. It might have worked in Oklahoma in 1981. It didn't work in 1990. We're, we're seeing a guy who could do something that we'd never seen before. So the governing that they put on Muda hurt him. But then they did this terrible tournament. And Muda had to lose four times, three or four times in one pay-per-view. It was a round-robin turn. It was garbage. It was terrible. And you took the most talented person, sans flair. I mean, flair is flair. But you took the most talented person, and, and you drum-rolled him out. And it was it was sad. Yeah, it was. Uh, I did see some, you know, some video on that. Uh, before that happened, uh on his second U.S. excursion in 88, um, we spent some time in Puerto Rico as the Super Black Ranger gimmick. Um, and then March of 89, he would debut the Great Muda in WCW, where, where you were just picking up on. And, yeah, he would have he would have great feuds there with uh, Lex Luger and Ric Flair and, of course, the battles with Sting. He, Sting. Would, actually, he would actually pick up a TV title from Sting um, in his debut year. Uh, he returns to Japan in 90. He picks up some more tag gold. With uh, Machihiro Chono, and yeah. then di- yeah, and during that time he would he was performing as Muto for regular matches, and then he would only call upon the Great Muto gimmick for big time matches, like one he had against Ricky Steamboat, and those battles with Sting. Oh, man. Uh, Steamboat, Steamboat, and Muto. You want to talk about a wrestling clinic? Something you could watch today. Your AEW crowd. Who loves I couldn't the find the full sports. clip on it. I, I only find hard. little small highlights. Yeah, I wish very, I could have found hard. it. Did now? Did you find that little mini movie about the demon Muda? No. Okay, it's Talk to me. Uh, okay. So basically, they filmed a, like a little movie about like Kei Mudo falls asleep and he wakes up and he's on a planet and he becomes this demon, the Great Muda. Is it an anime? No, it's all no. it's it's Kei Mudo. It's it's Muda. It's oh. it's him. It it was it. I'll send it to you because, I mean, this is – even though when we're done with this project, we're done with this project, it doesn't mean that we don't still stop loving the great Muda. So – but it's very interesting. Like this was actually filmed, and it was filmed for New Japan Pro Wrestling. And um, New, New Japan, you had – with Chono Muda Liger – and then you had uh, other mainstayers like Tenzan, and of course Anoki wasn't going away anytime soon. You had basically what was the Ohio Valley wrestling class of John Cena, Randy Orton. But Rob. exactly, that's mm-hmm. what you had. It was it was the Japanese equivalent. It just happened 15 years earlier. So you had your future already set out for you, and you had these guys that had their own characters. And it's very interesting that you talk about like he he won tag team gold with Chono. Well, Chono is probably the person that should induct him into the Hall of Fame. Chono, they they played their roles so well as he you know as as adversaries as well as allies, and that's what I loved about everything that we could see. So Muda back in Japan, he's developing the character more and more, and he's playing the dual role, which is so unheard of and let me ask you one thing uh, do, do you know any other people any other wrestlers besides maybe Balor who was obviously influenced if you guys don't know Balor came from Japan I mean he's British but he came from Japan um, anybody else that, that, that played a dual role the one that comes straight to mind is Mick mm-hmm. Foley Tax okay. Jack M- Mankind do love absolutely and while i don't feel like that was influenced by muda it's the fact that people like muda paved the way to make it okay and that you're right and the only person i can think of is a person that was directly influenced by cactus jack mankind and that was joseph parks aka abyss i remember that 
Yeah. Back in TNA. So, so you, we look at like some of these people who are polarizing and you say, okay, why? Well, what, what's the it factor? So in this time, now we're back in the 90s, and Muda is blowing up in Japan. And he is doing things that nobody's ever seen before. Then all of a sudden, a little storyline happens in WCW. It's called the NWO. And it becomes so big that it's bled through to Japan, even though it was actually influenced by a storyline in Japan. It was changed and churched up enough to where uh, it was supposed to be unrecognizable. Now, Masahiro Chono joins the group. So, Kihai Mudo is fighting against the group, but then ends up joining the group as the great Muda and would fight them on and off in the same card while he's still part of them. Have you ever heard of anything like that? When I when I when I saw those clippings of that, it blew my mind. No, I haven't. Not for any one man to run two gimmicks at the same time in the same storyline on the same night. That that blew my mind. Um, that's whenever I think when I found out that fact is when he rose to the top of my Rushmore list. I, I, I couldn't it's, believe it. I was stunned. It 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 it. I don't know if it could work in America. I mean, I, I it could. It's like you say, the three faces of Foley, um, but we, we bought it because it was mostly babyface, but it, it's the fact that he's fighting against the people, but coming out with the people. And the fans, you look back and the fans would boo him as one persona and cheer him as the other. And Japan's different, okay, folks? So I love Japanese pro wrestling because it's something that was way more advanced when I was younger and part of the tape trading era, so on and so forth. I won't bore you guys with it, but the fact is uh, they use all kinds of crazy gimmicks in Japan. People will have their character based on food. Like a person will be like Mushroom Man, and it, it, it gets over. But they'll work like no one's business. And this was something that was captivating audiences, and kids were scared of the great mood. They would cover their eyes and hide. From the great Muda. But if Keihai Mudo came out, they would rush to the gate and hold on to it, white knuckling, because they couldn't wait to get a glimpse of their hero. Do you think the kids knew the difference, though? I don't think the kids did. And if they did, it was suspended suspended belief. That's what I feel. It was suspended belief. Well, we have to suspend our belief in this business at you know some point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you did you did jump ahead a little bit uh, to the, okay. the NWO era of Angle. So I want to take a little a few years back, continuing his continuing his success in '92. Uh, he said he he said he rises as a single star. He did lose his first attempt at the IWGP title as Mudo um, against Ricky Chosen, and he also had a losing effort in the NWA title tournament. Then he donned the great Mudo persona once again to win his first world title winning the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. He would then go on to capture the NWA Heavyweight title, thus becoming a double champ. Yes. After a year-long title reign, he would eventually lose both titles. Then he would pick up another tag title as Muto in 93. And then, one of those big-time matches that you talked about earlier, he would go on to wrestle Hulk Hogan. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? It's the first time in history you've ever actually seen Hulk Hogan work. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> folks. I'm not a Hogan fan. Neither um, am I. I he doesn't like my dad, the, though. <laughs> I, I grew up with the, you know, say your prayers, eat your vitamins, all that Hulkamania stuff. And it was it was trash. It was it, like at first it was fun because it was all America. But let's get into brass tacks and baseball bats. He was not a great worker in the ring. He was – Kick, punch, body slam, leg drop. Like he was Seamus. Wow. And um, who I, I also now. yeah. And Cena can do some stuff. Compared to Hogan, Cena is Ric Flair. But so Seamus won his I, first title off of Cena. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. Let's not go there. Okay, yeah, let's not. So, so let's yeah. We can go down that rabbit hole all day, and we'll never get off the the, the phone with each other. But um, so. Hogan has a match against Muda in a, in a Japanese merger with WWF. 
And it was something to behold. Now, did it blow your mind when you saw Hogan work like that? Yeah, it did. Uh, I don't think I ever seen him really. Sw- I mean, I've seen him sweat, but just the way it's like with Hulk always going over. This was he was out wrestled in this match with Utmuda, and he seemed like he was also a step behind. So it was good to see him in a different light in that sense. It, it was it was one. If if you folks haven't seen it, please watch it. Hogan versus Muda, and the fact that the the post media wrestling scrum they used to do those in New Japan all the time. He even cuts a promo saying Muda is the wrestler he wishes he was, something along those lines. But Hogan chain wrestled. Hogan tried to keep up with him, but he couldn't. And Hogan did moves he never does in America. Now I don't know why he did all this for Muda. I think it's a beautiful and amazing. But it's just one of those things, like once in a lifetime, like, did this really happen or did I imagine it? And if you don't find the clips, you would think that we're filling you, filling you full of BS, but we're not. This is this really happened. It was great. So it's, it's one of those matches that you just have to really invest time in and say, this actually happened because I can't believe it. I really can't believe it. Hogan was trying to do a little bit of aerial. I mean, not a lot. He was doing a you know, like high cross bodies, whatever, for the time for him, for his 300 pound size, that was cool, you know, but it, to, to watch him like try to chain wrestle with Muda is, it's insane. <laughs> yeah. So after the big time match with Hogan, Muda goes on in 94 and we got a dream match when he took on Antonio Inoki. Oh, dear Lord. Now, that one so, I did not get to see, so please. Tell us your thoughts. Okay, Inoki is – he is considered almost a god in Japan. Uh, here he was. And Inoki, I mean he went on from wrestling, a wrestling promoter to Congress to – he influenced everything. If Inoki said do it, you did it. That's just the way it went. There were two people who were more influential in Japan than – whoever was running government and that was giant baba and and noki and they ran both the wrestling promotions and for you to get a match with Inoki is a big thing because he wouldn't wrestle just anybody he wouldn't if he did he squashed you and if he didn't like you he would hurt you and if people don't remember Inoki had the 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 famous uh match against uh, muhammad ali yeah, of course, he, he crab walked through the whole thing. They used different roles, so neither one could lose face because he knew that Ali could knock him out, but he knew that he could uh, out-wrestle Ali. I mean, Muhammad Ali was not a wrestler. Obviously, Muhammad Ali came from Louisville, which is where I am right now. And so getting back to where it's supposed to be, when you got the spotlight with Anoki, it was a big thing. No matter how old he was, it was a very big deal. So, you know, they, they, they had matches. When, when, when you wrestled Inoki in Japan, you were a made man. You were a certified, bona fide main eventer, period, for the rest of your life. And that's what he was, and that's what happened. See, and he got to that point 10 years into his wrestling career. You know, most guys don't even get, to the, get a title in their 10 years, in their first 10 years. So for him to, like I said, this guy's winning titles basically every year of, of his career up to this point. You know, every year he's winning a championship. After the dream yeah. match with Noki, he goes on and 95 picks up his second world title. Uh, he's got a few more title defenses there. Drops the title to uh, Takata in 96. And then this is where we pick up with the NWO Japan angle. Basically yeah. between 96 and 2000. Uh we know that he's injured in 98, you know, most 98, 99 has nagging injuries, but still manages to pick up a third world title. So is there anything else about the NWO ego that you want to go ahead and elaborate on us? Because well, after that, he takes an extended hiatus to re- rehabilitate his knees before returning in 2000. Okay, so one thing, like... I, there's a lot of people who make fun of WCW, WCW, you know, like they don't understand that its roots were in the NWA in the old days, and it was the best wrestling. It wasn't that WWE stuff. WWE just had more money to market themselves and drive everybody out of business. And 
the best thing about WCW is that they did not mind mentioning other promotions and inviting other promotions to work with them, the Forbidden Door. And they opened that Forbidden Door for Muda quite a bit. And for Masahiro Chono, uh, Tenzan, there's quite a few people. Uh, Yuji Nagata, they would bring them over and work with them. And it was great. And so one of the big things was they would talk about the NWO Japan, NWO America. NWO America had like Scott Norton, who always worked in Japan, so he was also part of NWO Japan. And you had Muto join the group. And of course, Chono was the first person to jump on board with it, and it was a perfect fit for him. So as as it being the tape trading era and the birth of the internet back then, this is like 96, well, that's 97, 98, 99 era. You were trying to see what was happening in Japan also because this angle was so hot. And the only people that were going against the NWO because it was so hot in Japan, the NWO Japan this is, but was Chris Benoit and the Junior Horseman. That's what they called them. And it's hard to find anything with that. It's hard to find anything with that. But that was like that, it, that's all that was left. Liger was left out of it. I don't know why. I think because they considered him too small. He was considered a junior, and he never uh, he never went public to demand and command that he was going to be a heavyweight. So Liger was completely left out of it, and it was just. It was stuff that you just wanted to get your hands on, and you couldn't. And I still can't get my hands on a lot of that stuff. More of it you can find on Daily Motion than you can find on uh, YouTube, because Daily Motion is seen as the the, the B of the two. But um, WCW was amazing for that, and and, and seeing the great Muda any time on a Monday night was amazing. During the during the ratings wars, you've got the Smoking Guns versus the Body Donnas on Raw, and then you've got the great Muda and Masahiro Chono coming out, build from New Japan Wrestling, going against who it doesn't matter because you were going to see a clinic. What were you going to watch? It sure as hell wasn't the smoking guns. So, Well, during that time, you know, we got that Monday Night Wars going on. So I'm WWF through and through. Um, I would only switch to WCW Nitro when WWF was on a commercial. So I know I would see NWO here and there. That's when I, how I learned about Jericho. Going back and doing the research on Muda, I do remember seeing the NWO face paint, but didn't think nothing of him. I just thought he was another guy because they were so overbooked oh, and yeah. so many, so many members. So like, that was the only way I watched WCW was when WWF was on commercial. Um, so fair enough. That's why we're doing the show. Yeah. Um, and like I said, when you gave me the work to do, it's just. I'm still learning about him. Like I said, we can't find all the video on him. But after doing the uh, rehabilitation to his knees, and he go, you know he takes some time off, and he returns to WCW in 2000, which that was a very problem because he returned to WCW in 2000. You know it was a sinking ship. Guys were already jumping to WWF. You know they, they were bleeding dry with money. So he, he had some entertaining spots with Vampiro. Um, I think that they could have done more with that. Um, yeah, speaking Jericho, of, he, he picks up tag titles with Vampiro and Dark Carnival Angle. So there's another title you add to his reign or to his there, legacy. There's, there's so much more that they could have done with him at that time. I mean, people wanted to see him, but they were putting more focus on Vampiro. And the Dark Carnival thing just wasn't doing him any favors. And it, it, when you get paired up with ICP and the Kiss Demon – why don't they just stamp loser on your forehead? You know, why don't you just change your face paint to loser? And it was so sad because they weren't utilizing the mist. They weren't us- utilizing anything with him at that point. And anybody who was a real wrestling fan, like I was like more of a historian uh, that actually got to watch some of the territories and see Muda and know about him from 89 and things like that. We were disgusted by the way he was being used. They lose their tag titles to Chronic. I believe it was Chronic. And he's the one who has to take the pin. And Vampiro was new to America, but he was he, he has a lot of history in AAA. And I'm not taking anything away from him. But the focus, really, people wanted to see Muda. And, and, and he was treated like the round-robin tournament of 
91 or whatever and, and, and just treated like an enhancement talent. He's so much better than that. And it, it, it ticked me off. It ticked me off personally to see, you know, a wrestler that's so amazing and so so much of a draw to be treated like that. And this is also a time where WCW has Bischoff to Russo to nobody knows who's going to be taking care of it to a committee to anybody and their brother helping run the place. And how do you treat a talent that is so enhanced? like the great Muda to be stigmatized to a tag team and, and be the B team member of the tag team. when He's clearly the a player. How do you do that? I, I wish I had an answer for you. I really do. Um, I think it was more just to the fact that he was overseas and they didn't want to put over. I know he's a great talent, but they didn't want to put him over because he couldn't speak the language. He couldn't do the promos. He couldn't be your, your face of the company. He could be your the best wrestler in your company, but he couldn't be the face of your company. That's just that's what I believe. It's, it's I just, know it's, it, 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 it was it was depressing at the time, and it, it it I don't know if it was Russo's era, but it kind of feels like it. Like America has to go over America, you know, and it, it's no, you know, like the, this guy is is super talented. I I don't. It, it was it was a very depressing uh, point to see Muda in, and you you could tell his work wasn't terrible, but you could tell like even for Muda, if he fakes the funk in the rink, the rink, the ring, he <laughs> is still better than ninety nine percent of the people that you have there, and you could tell he was just going through motions. Like um, while his ring presence is amazing and his his. Ring psychology was great. It's like his ring presence and psychology had been stripped. Like he just went through motions, and you could see that he wasn't going to be there long. Yeah, it takes guys years and years to develop that ring presence and become a ring general. It seems like Muda had it ever since his early days, and to be booked the way he was, and like how you said, to be stripped of that. That extra mystique, that that extra X factor that he would deliver to the audience was just a waste of his talents. But I'm about to turn your frown upside down. Okay. So, Muda has his last match in WCW in 2000, September of 2000. But yeah. he did he did leave with a no complete cause, which prevented him from competing in, in, in WWF or WWE. Yes. So, if Muda did not have that. No complete cause of contract. More than likely, I think we can agree that he would have came to WWF. Uh, I'm assuming Vince was at least knew who he was or whoever. JR was at the head of booking, knew who this guy was and would have wanted to pick up the talent. Do you believe that to be so? No, oh, I, I know JR would have loved to have had him. I mean, they, they, they tried with imitation versions like Hakushi. Uh, Taker worked over in Japan for a couple weeks and that's how they discovered Hakushi, who was Jinzei Shizaki, and they thought, okay, we'll bring this guy in. They just didn't realize that he was only five foot eleven. So they're like, okay, we want to bring in this guy, and we can't use him, and they used him improperly. And I think that's another reason that Muda never came over, because he saw the way that Jinzei Shizaki was was utilized. Um, but JR was very familiar with him. He was in WCW during Muda's runs. He would have loved to have him. I, I don't think anybody would have denied that WWE would have salivated and rubbed their hands together to, to get the great Muda. And this was a time now where you didn't have to be renamed, that they would actually recognize people from other promotions and recognize people's accomplishments from other promotions. So I firmly believe he would have been the great Muda. Uh, what his push would have been would have been limited to who his opponents would be. With Vince, you never know. He might yawn and he changes his mind. But Muda, can you imagine Muda and Shawn Michaels? Shawn Michaels is at the top of my Rushmore list. And to think of those two guys in the ring, which I actually already did, uh, very easily match of the year, uh, you got two guys who are considered the best wrestler on the planet and two different eras of their career. Uh, I just, 
I don't think we'll get a fight for every chance like immediately. It it would never stop. I mean, you, you're talking about. I mean, I'm, I hate Michael's backstage politics, but I respect what he's done in the ring. Okay, and I I I could see. Michael's going for sweet chin music just to get misted. Ooh. And, you know, remember, Michael's broke out a moonsault on Bret Hart. That was that was the first time WWE had seen something. I actually I think Owen Hart had done it first, but um but it was it was I think Mania. I think it was the Iron Man match. Michaels did it. Now don't quote me, I could be wrong, but people didn't see stuff like that. Because was, were, the WWE product was very kick punch body slam, right. and you, you, now you're seeing someone doing a moonsault, and you're going, "What the?" You know. That's what really drew me to Michaels, and why I fell in love with him. Why he's my favorite of all time is because he was doing stuff that I had never seen before. At the time, coming up as a young kid, he gets injured, comes back, and he's still at the top of his game, still high level, and is on, on his own level. Same way how Muda was doing stuff in America that we hadn't seen. Muda exactly. was considered the best wrestler on the planet in his early days and in his later in, in his later years. So if, if people don't know who the Muda, great Muda is and why he's so great, just think of it in U.S. terms of Michael's back-to-back, you know, top-tier level of runs before and after the injury. Same thing with Muda, before and after his injuries to his knees. I, I would say it, for anybody who's not familiar with the great Muda, imagine if you could meld the mystique of The Undertaker with the work ethic of Shawn Michaels. And then you would have a Japanese man named Keihai Muda. Yeah. And that would be – that would be he, he was the ultimate performer. He was the ultimate uh, team player. You never hear stories about Muda not wanting to do things. You know, and it, if he had issues, it was usually with the office, and some of the saddest things was Muda jumping from New Japan to All Japan, then to uh, Enoki's Genome and stuff like that, like the, the different corporations. And he, as much as he needs to be in the WWE Hall of Fame, which more and more we're, res- we're we're realizing it's it's the wrestling hall of fame, which really it's not. Um, he needs to be in the New Japan Hall of Fame because he he helped hold that company on his back for a long time. And him his his feuds with Chono his his matches in America everything was great, but yes he sh- he should have come over to WWF E whatever you want to call it at the time. Shawn Michaels, I mean. I don't even think Michaels was wrestling, but you know what? When he came back, can you imagine? How about Muda and Kurt Angle? How about Muda and Brock Lesnar, which I'm sure has happened in Japan? Um, Muda, it, it, Stone Cold. I mean, they I, they might have wrestled each other in WCW back when they they did ahead. in '94. They did in '94, stunning Steve Austin. Um, the match wasn't that great. I was able to watch most of that match. Um, they just didn't have the chemistry. From what I can tell, it wasn't a long match, maybe like eight minutes or so. But with, of course, we would have the great Muda debut in WWE, not Muto, is who we would see, right? We would see Muda. Exactly. Exactly. So, you have to. Yeah. So with him being able with multiple personas like Foley and Banner, like we had mentioned, um, again, we have him having his last match in September of 2000. So if he were going to debut in w- you know, WWE at the time, it was either going to be in late 2000. Or early 2001. So what I would do with the Japanese wrestlers being seen as demons from overseas, I would have yes. Muda de- debut in WWE as you know the Demon Muda, and then on my marquee I have the Demon Muda versus the Devil's favorite Demon King. Oh, now I would have Muda go over. Itself. It, it would does. I would have Muda go over. It's not a squash match, but he's the storyline is that he's trying to put down Kane, send him to hell forever. And then he, it, 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 it's beautiful. It's absolutely yeah. beautiful because, like you're saying, so the fantasy booking going forward, who avenges Kane? 
well, none other than Big Brother Taker. But you have to keep in mind at this time, in mid May, in May of 2000, we get the dawn of the American Badass gimmick. So at the time of this fantasy booking with Muda debuting, we wouldn't have you know Dark Taker. We would have the American Badass. So what do you think the dynamic of the American Badass? And I know his move sets very similar to you know Undertaker, but how do you see the dynamic of the American Badass and the Muda? In ring. It's great because it's a reversal of roles. It makes all the sense in the world. Like, one thing I'll give Vince McMahon, even though he helped try to kill pro wrestling by taking it over, is the fact that he'll look at someone and say, you've done great work. You've done great work. You're over. Now let's flip you. And it was it, it's like the thing he did with The Rock. He made everybody... Boo the hell out of the rock. Keep smiling. Keep being the blue chipper. And when when Vince McMahon realized that his idea was rotten, it was stinking garbage, he had said to a bunch of people backstage, in one year, this guy's going to be the biggest star in the business. All I have to do is flip him. Did the same thing with Kurt. Exactly. Kurt – well, Kurt did it to himself. Kurt was the one who said, don't boo me. I'm – and and that was actually – from the stories I've heard – Legit, like he he got offended because he was an Olympic hero and he told people not to boo him. He was un- couldn't understand because he was he was too Hogan like. Right. He didn't believe yeah. that they were gonna boo him, especially in his hometown. They booed him so even you, more. So you take the Undertaker out of the Undertaker gimmick into the American Badass, which was my favorite, and a lot of people hate that, but. Taker will tell you he loved it the most because that's when he could sell and actually show he wrestled and gave back to the people he cared about in that ring. You take him out of that element and then you bring in Muda as the demon. You've got something. You've got magic. And you've got the smaller guy. That's the best part is the fact that Taker could work with smaller guys. He could work with HBK. He could work with um, Ben Wallace. Bret Hart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Muda was in that size category. He actually, he's a lot bigger than HBK, uh, I think, whatever. The point is, Muda and and Taker, could you imagine that in the Hell in a Cell? Uh, when Hell in a Cell actually meant something, it wasn't just a theme. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine them in, oh, shoot, like, I mean, the, the, the types of match. A very match or a casket oh. match. A casket match would be great. Yeah. Because if he put The Undertaker in a casket at his size with his unique move set, hit him with the mist, knocked him with the elbow, somehow got him to tumble into the casket and then closed it and stepped on it long enough for the casket to be closed, consider the match open uh, over, and then Taker gets his heat back by opening it up, Muda falls off. You've got to pay off for both. I could even see that where Muda had a casket match with Kane, and that's how he puts the oh, final nail in the coffin, so to speak. And that's you send. That's how you write Kane off TV, and then starts to feud with Taker. You know, look, you cannot have anything like two. Too popular, too important. Like Hogan, why did we sour on Hogan? Because he was unstoppable. He was unbeatable. So Undertaker, he's like one of those things. Like, you know, he was unbeatable. But you you have something like so unique and different to go against him. You're going to buy it, especially smaller. That's the key thing because giant versus giant, it, it, it doesn't work. I mean those big show versus Kane, big show versus Undertaker matches – Big show basically in anything, it, it doesn't really work. And and it you get two guys who one can work and one can't, it, it it's garbage matches. Whereas Muda could work with anybody. And it's funny because you could call them the Godzillas of wrestling. And it's funny because I'll bring this back. In the Godzilla movie from I think it was 2013, 2012, I don't know. What did they call Godzilla's enemies? With Miami? Mudos. You sure right. Yeah. So think about that. He even influenced pop culture. 
That's what he was to wrestling, and yet nobody talks about this man. This man's about to retire. He's he's wrestled some of his last matches as the Great Muda, and now he's going to probably continue a few more matches as Kihai Muto, but how do we put him out? How does how does he go out? How does he go into a WWE ring? Well, like I said, debuts, takes on Kane, puts him down. Big Brother comes back to the Vengeance. And then there's this time we're in 2001. So we're gearing up for WrestleMania 17. That's where I put the first match at, WrestleMania 17. What really, what really blows my mind about that if this could have happened and I would have found out about Buddha all what twenty two years ago, <laughs> I was at WrestleMania seventeen. I would have seen this match. I could have been there. I would have learned about Muda when he debuted coming in, and then I would have done my research on him, learned about him, and you know by now who knows I might have had a Muda, a Muda action figure, which I actually want. I'm on the lookout for one. I'm in the market. <laughs> But you also have to think about at this time, you know, WCW is going to be bought. And, you know, we have the invasion angle in 01. We also have the ECW roster there. So we, when we're talking about dream matches, I got Mudo against RVD. We got to put him against Sabu. Oh, Lord, Lord. I mean, you know, we got we have TLC matches, and there's just, there's so many things to that you could do with this guy. But of the returning stars from WCW. Or the ones that we got in the evasion, who would you have him refeud with during that time? You know, refuting—that's a really good question. Uh, the invasion did no did no favors for anybody. So, honestly, I would go in a fresh angle. I would have Muda against Edge. I would blow the doors off of it because you have Gangrel helping out Edge with the blood. Versus the mist. Now, even though Edge is way past that in his career, it would be kind of like a calling in a favor thing. Okay. Um, and I think that the two of them, I think that the clash of styles would work really well. And Edge is a very impactful wrestler. Uh, at least he was at that time. I don't want to see the ladders. I don't want to see the high spots unless it's in the ring. I don't want to see breaking the furniture. Maybe one spot on a table, something like that. That's it. But I think those two could have told the best story at that time. I think those two could have torn the roof off the place, taken the main event away from anything. I guarantee you that. Well, if you're trying to build up Muda that big, then you're not going to put him in Brock's side of you. Because at the time when Brock debuts, I mean, he's on a rampage. He's squat. He's not squashing everybody, but he's beating everybody. And if you put him if with Vince in charge, you put him Brock against Muda, I think it becomes you know too much of a squash match. So I think you keep them apart as long as possible, even though Brock was only there for a few years during his first run. Well, Brock, Brock and Muda, it's it's love hate. Um, it's one of those things that they're never going to keep Brock down. They're never going to do anything with, you know, like I said, edge edge would be the money, but Brock. If done right and made a competitive match. I don't think American audiences would buy it. I really don't. Yeah, because at this time you would, you would have had Brock debuts in 02, correct? Yes. Okay, so then you, you would have had Muda on the roster for about a year, mm-hmm. but in Brock's first run, he, he beats uh, the first year everybody. everybody, you know, Angle and Taker and Hogan, like Rock. Those first couple of years, that first run. So I think you keep them apart, but you know, it, the money would have been Edge. To be honest with you, it just it it, it would have been the best story in the world. They, you can utilize it. You can manipulate it. You can stretch it out. You can make it sexy. You can make it um, different. You can go to the goth edge. You can go to the funny, goofy edge. But Edge versus Muda, I think, would have been putting asses in seats. Brock with Edge, it, it, it would have had to wait another year. And, of course, Brock goes over then. Because, I mean, let's be honest. Who's beating up Brock Lesnar? 
Bruce Brody is dead. Nobody. Haku is retired. So, you know, it's it's the, the, uh, Andre has been way past. So, um, no. but now let's let's look at the last part of the tenure of the Great Muda. So the face paint goes away. He does. He shaves his head, grows out the goatee, and all, all new image. It was hard for me to digest. I thought it was a different wrestler. Um, and this was back 16, 17 years ago. Uh, there was American Muda, and it was it was Muda, but it was the image that we see now. And it was very hard for me to believe it was the same Muda. I thought it was a different person. I thought that it was just somebody calling themselves American Muda, kind of like uh, Brian Danielson was the American Dragon. But it turns out it was Muda. He didn't want to paint his face anymore, so he wears a mask. He shaves his head. And I mean, I'm, I'm 47 years old, you know, but I look great. And I think about, like, I don't want to accept I'm getting older. I couldn't imagine for a guy who had to have his knees replaced, hip surgery, elbow surgery, um, what he does. People say, oh, it's 10 minutes. You work for 10 minutes. Well, he works those 10 minutes every night on a tour and he has to train for those 10 minutes every day for three hours and those 10 minutes are impactful on the body they don't get what those 10 minutes are i i i I had a hard time digesting when he changed his look i really did how about for you like when you saw the the change and the transition so it's it's very hard to, for me to believe that Mudo's the same guy from his early days with, with the face paint to Mudo without it because he looks totally different. So seeing him with the hair and the face paint and the, the black trunks in his early days and then seeing him bald with no face paint, with no mask, it look, you know, the guy, it doesn't look the same to me. Like, with, like for example, like with Sting, you, you can, he looks like Sting without the face paint with it on. But Mudo, totally different. So seeing it for me, it was just, you know, like a brand new guy. Um, I can see why he did it, changed the image, going with the times. And then, you know, he would start donning the the mask, which are really cool, unique. Um, I I really love his mask. Um, Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it was just mind-blowing for me to see the difference. So a question you asked me when we were off air was, what was the Muda scale? So, right. Let's so into that. let's it's, let's do that, and that yeah. actually brings me to another thought: um, the Muda scale. Okay. So let's start with the Muda scale, and we'll go to your thought. So all right. here's here's the deal with the Muda scale, folks. Basically, Muda had filmed a match, like a death match, that took place on an island, and I cannot figure out who his opponent was. But he bled so much; he bled buckets over buckets. And they say if you want to figure out how bad someone's bleeding is on a wrestling match, you you rate it on a 1 to 10 versus what Muda bled that day. So that's the Muda scale. Now, before I figured that out and I was enlightened from my brother, I always thought that uh, it meant how great of an aerial worker you were or how great of an innovator you were. So I was very, very wrong. Yeah, so first time I came across it, I thought it was cool that something so unique was was dubbed by him. Um, when it comes to bleeders, I always like to refer to the best bleeders club by our very own Mimi Burris, which I know you're <laughs> friends with. Yeah. So anytime I see somebody with the crimson mask, I automatically think of Mimi, and then I think of the Muda scale. Uh, like you said, it's a measurement for how much somebody bleeds. So. It, when you think like you, you would think it'd be called the Ric Flair scale as much as he as he's bled over the years. But you see the the face, the Crimson Mask, Triple H has done it, HBK has done it. You know we've seen so many guys do it. Uh, Ruby Soho just did it. You know a few, few months back in AEW, Britt Breaker made it very popular uh, again. I mean it made her very popular. That's how she got Dusty. over it one, in Dusty, one way. Please. Dusty. So to, just to know that this guy influenced people. To bleed is just on another level. Well, it, 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 
how they could they judged it versus what he bled. You know, I mean, I, it's it's another one that folks. I mean, if you weren't part of the tape trading community, it's very hard to find that footage. It's very very hard. And then if you do, you really don't want to watch it because I don't do blood. I really don't do blood. And um, even wrestling blood, like sometimes there's too much. Like uh, if anybody watches uh, Chris Jericho's last match in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, it there's a point where there's too much blood. A little bit of color, fine. A lot of color for the right storyline. But then when when it's like get a transfusion when you're done, eh, you're going a little too far. Like Bruce Brody and Abdullah the Butcher, there's some of their stuff. Eh, I wouldn't be eating. I wouldn't be. Yeah. Eating. You probably don't want to watch Kings of Road Wrestling. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So going forward with Muda's life, you being new to him, what do you think? was some of his highlights and some of his lowlights and what would you do with him as far as introducing him if if you were the person to to introduce him into the hall of fame how would you say this is the great muda wow really putting me on a spot there um well going back to his early days uh like i said this guy's winning championships every year I don't think there's any any low any low parts that you think of the injuries or the NWO angle where he wasn't used to his full potential. And o- over the years going forward, you know this guy would have success in in every in every part in every decade of his career. He's having success winning championships. So this guy's a, you know a bell collector essentially. So I think I would I would dub him the bell collector. As far as inducting him to the Hall of Fame. Now, you had mentioned earlier you would have Chono as his the person to induct him. I, you know, in a dream world, if if yeah, but you know, it's it's just one of those things. Chono Chono was amazing. Chono was something different, and he played his role, and he and Muda played off each other. There, there's people say Steamboat and Flair or Sting and Flair, or you know. Uh, what what's your greatest rivalry that you can pick? But it's it, Chono and Muda stick together. It's it's that's that's New Japan. It's yeah. They're, they're I started to see that pattern. Together. I started to see the pattern, but I just didn't have enough time to or find enough footage on it to you know to have a a true true passionate opinion about it. But I can see that they're connected. Well, also, um, do we mention the match? Where Jushin Liger actually took off his mask? Uh, no, I saw that on the video with the steels, but I did not see any footage on it. So. It's very hard to find the footage on it, but uh, there was actually a match where Jushin Liger demasked and he was painted up like Muda, and he misted Muda. It made Japan lore. It was, it was insane. It was great. It was crazy. It was. Jushin Liger taking off his mask? Come on. That doesn't happen. And, of course, against the person he's always going to be compared to, the great Muda. It's it's insane to see how somebody has had so much influence and so much history, and yet people virtually don't know they are. And it, like I said, it really blows my mind how somebody so influential would just go under the radar for me. And speaking about, you know, how much he's done, again, he would level up again and winning the Triple Crown in, in 01. So we're, we're past we're past the uh, WCW days. Okay. Uh, he has a career resurgence. He continues to have success all through, you know, the early 2000s to the 2010s with various big-time feuds and various title reigns. Again, like we talked about, you know, he changed the image, which was in 01 when he – Shave the head and grow out the goatee. And then this is when he started also to appear part-time for All Japan, which you did mention earlier too. So yes. I want to, can you speak to the significance of him going from New Japan to All Japan, what that would be in a U.S. translation? In a U.S. translation, it's like cutting off your left arm. 
Uh, it's it, you don't do that. You just don't screw up like that. It's it's going from one promotion to another. It's if John Cena showed up on AEW tomorrow, that's the significance. If Randy Orton, anybody who's a storied person in today's culture, especially important, like John Cena has his importance in Rome uh, in wrestling history, and imagine Roman Reigns tomorrow. Shows up in AEW. You'd all brown your knickers. That it's that's what would happen, and that's what that meant when Muda jumped shit. So kind of like if Taker would have jumped to WCW easily, and kept okay. his persona. See, that's the thing. They don't trademark it over there. They they're not like Vince, who everybody has to be this person. So it was it was very important that you can do whatever you wanted you had creative you didn't have creative control as yourself but your character could still be the same character as it was prior so all of a sudden he shows up on the major competitor and everybody's going what did i just see okay okay so see that makes a lot of sense it was musty yeah like i mean i can imagine um you know because when the effect of the invasion happened, of course, we didn't get all the big time stars at first, but the first time we saw NWO, first time we saw Goldberg, I, that was – it was a big deal, even though it took some time. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, imagine watching Raw in the 90s. All of a sudden, Goldberg comes out and spears Steve Austin. That's the effect that Muda had when he jumped to All Japan. That's it right there. All right, so by this time in his career, we're, you know, you know, mid 2000s, he's having influences on many future stars to come. And this does remind me of something that you had said to me off air that nobody's recognizing that Oscar's return is coinciding with Moodle's retirement. After all, if you look close enough, you can see that she has basically become the female Muda with so many resemblances. Yes. Back in an interview in 2011, the Empress of Tomorrow stated that she was never a fan of women wrestling, but she was very, very much a fan of the great Muda. As we know, but others don't, you know, Oscar was inspired by Muda in many ways with the face paint, the poison mist, of course, and that MMA flavored striking. It's very easy to see those influences filtered into Oscar as we know today. So with that being said, I have a scenario for you because we're talking about Muda potentially becoming in the Hall of Fame. After we did get the announcement of our first inductee this year of Rey Mysterio, if he was the second announcement or if he was announced at all, could you see him walking Oscar to the ring for her WrestleMania match against Bianca? And if so, how would you present it? I would make it the best pageantry you've ever seen in your life because this man has never been in a WWE ring. It's supposed to be a big thing, like uh, the first time WWE ring, but we're we're bringing a presence that's retiring that was so great to a new audience, even though he's old. The way I would do it is that I would have Oscar come out and then pause, and I would have. Maybe like little air gun flowers to pop up out of like little tubes all the way down the ring. And then maybe some confetti fall. And then she stops and bows. Then the Muda, the great Muda comes out and walks her to the ring, escorted like a father, giving away his daughter. And I would do it. Without the mask, I would do it with the face paint. And when he leaves the ring for her match, I would have him do the classic respectful thing, wipe your feet off on the apron. That shows your respect for the man. Mm-hmm. And I would have him pass on the gimmick to her, like, you've taken over now. That's how I would do it with Muda. I would, I would even, like, have... The Titantron would just say his name 
the place will go nuts for it. Because wrestling fans, we're down to the bare minimum of actual wrestling fans versus casual fans. Sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Casual Wrestling Fan. But I would I would have his name and I would just have like tons of pictures of him up there like real, really fast. And then he comes out and just look at the crowd, take it in, and then walk her down the aisle like he's giving away his daughter. And then he gives away the gimmick like, this is it. This is for you. Well, if we had him announced, for example, next week, then we would still have two, two and a half, three weeks enough time for WWE to show video packages on him to educate the masses who don't know about him. I would think so. You know, you just – it's strange. I mean we, we've seen people like Abdul the Butchers in, in the WWE Hall of Fame. I mean there's there's people that I remember from the old days that people don't remember now. There are people I don't think that should be in there that are in there. So yes, yes. Um I would, because they own all that footage, why not use it? You know, they love exploiting everything, so why not use it? And to touch on your entrance real quick for them, I will actually have them come out of, so at at the start of the entrance, you'd have a giant dragon head, and they would walk out the mouth of the dragon. Nice. And then you would have your your flower guns shooting the, the Japanese blossoms all down the ramp. And then, you know, once they get to the middle of the ramp, they stop, do the pose, pyro above the stadium, and then maybe more pyro when they get into the ring. But, of course, we can fantasy book this all day, but for the sake of time, for the sake of the listeners, we got to move on, buddy. So I, I want to I wanna talk to you about a forbidden door policy that I thought of. So okay. with Muda having multiple... U.S. excursions and, you know, coming over to the States. Can we credit him or say he's the man who paved the way? Is he the poster boy for the forbidden door that we know now in the States? Uh, The answer is no, because it was Ricky Dozen that happened in the 50s and 60s. And he was he's up there with Luthez and uh, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, like the, the forefathers of wrestling. Um. But I can say this much, that he is the modern-day version of that. He, he was the first person to, to, to make it popularized in my era, in your era, mm-hmm. and most listeners' older era, uh, except for Memphis Mark because he's older than me. Mm-hmm. And then it was Liger after him. And it was it was so fast. It was within a five-year period of both. So I, I can say that to some extent, yes, but he wasn't he wasn't the originator. Uh, I, I can say also that what he did for wrestling and the way he opened that that door for what, what I got to see and what a lot of people got to see, which was so new and different. He 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 gave us real wrestling magic. He gave us real truth he gave us like wow i've never seen somebody wrestle like this before and then you look at anybody who wasn't his protege but was influenced by him chris benoit he used the leg whip sean michaels he used the moonsault so did kurt angle there are people that he touched without even meeting or or he 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 did so much more for bringing what was happening in japan to america than anybody else in history. I mean, Ricky Dozen started it, but Muda was number one. And who could we give some credit to as a female Japanese wrestler who kind of opened that door for the female wrestlers to come over? Ooh, that's a really tough question. I'd say back in the early or late 80s, Jumping Bomb Angels. I think they're still the WWE Tag Team Women's Champions over there. I don't know. Because they just let belts go over. Um, you know, I, that's a really tough question. There's probably Bull Nakano. She was, she was a stud. She was uh, like, like Karma. I, I, Awesome Kong before Awesome Kong. She was just a crazy destroyer. 
Okay. That, 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 that'd be the closest thing I could think. And who could who would you say would be the best American export wrestler to to win gold in Japan? Because you had guys like AJ Styles and Brock Lesnar winning gold over there. Um, who do you think is the best one to ever win gold overseas? Well, see, this is going to be a little bit out of your realm, but um, probably Stan Hansen, Stan Larry Hansen, the man that WWE wouldn't hire because he broke their champion's neck in Madison Square Garden. Uh, he was all Japan's champion, and he was just – Stan Hansen couldn't see out of one eye. And he knocked uh, – I, I think he was the one who knocked one of Vader's eyes out, and you can actually see that, and it's disgusting. Um, he was just this rough, tough Texan cowboy, and he stayed over in Japan. He made his money in Japan. He was an AWA world champion, but he was all Japan's champion for a long time. He was triple crown champion. He was just this guy gene beast. He was a destroyer, and and he just he, – he made his money, and then the, the other one would be his tag partner for a long time, Bruiser Brody. And Bruiser Brody could go anywhere and make money until he died. Um, Bruiser Brody was just uh, – Mimi and I did a show on, on, you know, like some of our favorites of all time and best gimmicks. And Bruiser Brody was a man who went into business for himself, which was good and bad. I mean we're talking about a six foot eight, 300-pound man who would take a chain and just swing it around his head. And it was like a 200-pound chain. And – well, probably not 200 pounds. Let's be realistic. Like yeah, let's be real. Yeah. But he would swing this around, and he would just walk into crowds and do this, and everybody would part like the Red Seas because he could. And who was going to stop him? And he made a lot of money in Japan. So that's Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, Terry, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, Steve Williams. And most of them were all for all Japan. And then the other, an American for New Japan, I, I have to say the fallen one, Chris Benoit. I mean, wrestling is Pegasus Kid. He uh, won the first J-Cup, uh, first or second J-Cup, uh, Super Juniors tur- Tournament. I mean, it was, it was different. Okay, okay. So, back to the Forbidden Door. Uh, yes. In July of 2013 Muda would announce the foundation of a new promotion named Wrestle One. Yes. So opening the forbidden door again with TNA and Wrestle One, he would wrestle in both promotions between 2014 and 2019. As most wrestlers should know by now, he did make this surprise appearance in AEW where he returned to save Sting, one of his greatest rivals, which he would also have one of his last matches with. Is there anything from those TNA days that you want to highlight? Because I just I didn't have the time to do the research as much as I wanted to. There was just so much to cover in this guy's career. Then there's no way that I can touch on every accolade, every title match, everything. Which I'm trying to get the meat and potatoes of everything over the, each from each decade. So is there anything you want to highlight? Well, from the TNA run, what I'd like people to do is take a can opener, start at your right ear. And use it all the way to your left ear. Pull your skull open and pour bleach on it. That didn't <laughs> exist. It was that bad. Uh, there's no way you embarrass an, a legend that way. It just Their product was so bad and, and trying to bring him in. And when, when you're on a dying ship like that, you just don't do that. Um, it, was, it was garbage. It was terrible. Okay. It was burning trash. Well, let's just leave it at that. It was that bad. <laughs> it was it was really that bad. Now, as far as the AEW, it was – the first best podcaster in Louisville is Jim Cornette. I'll never be able to touch his numbers. And he said it the best. He said, if you're going to have a star of that level on a show, you should advertise it. But I will say watching it as a fan and being 10 years old again and seeing him come out the way he did – in AEW, I popped. I popped so hard because I, I didn't expect it. I didn't know it. That's what made it special. So I can understand the advertising versus you know let's let's put more 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 seats in. 
but it was so cool. It was so cool. So he did. He did have his last match uh, just in February twenty first, about a month or so ago. I read a report, and I didn't know if it was true or not. But his Muda's actual first choice for a last match would have been against The Rock. I've heard about this too, and I, I just can't. I couldn't see the clash in style. I was having the same issue trying to picture the match, how it would go. I, mean, I don't know if what, The Rock can sell Muda's moves. I think it would be a selling issue on The Rock's part. Because I've seen Muda in his later matches, and that corkscrew elbow he does looks just as good as now as he did 30 years ago. It, sometimes you have somebody who just has something special that can never let go. And you talk about the corkscrew elbow versus the people's elbow. It sells itself, but the American crowd doesn't know it. Now, speaking of a move, uh, this reminds me about my thought. The Mist, why is it not always seen as a DQ? Because I've seen matches where it does it in front of the referee, match continues, and then I've seen others where it's automatic DQ. You know, it's that, that was part of the revolving door of uh, promoters. So basically with the NWA-WCW merger, you had a lot of people – like Kip Fry, Jim Hurd, and, and Bill Watts and all that. And they were all changing the rules as they all came into prominence. And that's what hurt that is the fact that some considered it part of your body. So therefore, it was already brought into the ring. Some people considered it illegal. So it was changed and that that's in some people like in Kip Fry's case never should have been part of wrestling at all and didn't know what to do. So you, you had all these different people who were trying to rewrite the book at all times. And it was, it was just, it was a difficult time. I mean, honestly, I, I see it like Hogan's belt, his weight belt. He wore it to the ring, so therefore it's part of the uniform. That's how he got away with using people or uh, abusing people with it. Okay. Um, and then in other times when different people would book, you couldn't use it. it, it it's just one of those situations. Kind of like so, Dilo Brown in his vest. Exactly. That's a really good analogy. Who else but, had it? Bob Orton had the cast. Uh, Orton had the cast, yeah. Santino Morella had the Cobra. God, I wish he uh, just... He had Sacco. Yeah, there, there, there's so many situations like that where it's something that, I mean, it's so, it's, it's not illegal for you to kick someone with your boot on, but if you take your boot off and use it as a weapon, all of a sudden it's illegal. It doesn't make sense. So it's one of those loopholes that, that, that kind of slip through the wrestling cracks. Okay. Well, that I, that makes sense. I can see that. Uh, and another little thing that people don't know, because I know people wonder how, how do they get in the mouth or where does it come from? So Kabuki back in the day, what he would used to do, I don't know if they still do it today, but they would actually put the green mist, which was food coloring. They would tie it off in a condom about the size of your pinky nail. Now, I don't know if he, where, where he had it around the ring or where he got it from, but that's how that's how he used it. Yeah, they're called squibs. Um, that's, okay. that's what, like, uh, a lot of movies use as, like, the exploding when a, a gunshot hits you. They call them squibs now. But... Um, yeah, basically that that was it. Yeah, it's kind of disgusting. It's really disgusting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All it right. is what it is, man. I mean, we, we we can't rewrite the book, right? Yeah, I mean that's you know pretty smart, and innovative for the time. I would think. I mean, how, how else would you do it? But uh, you know, again, could, we could go on. Yeah, how else would you think about it? I mean, how else would you have them do it? Uh, I can't think. I I, I mean, I would say maybe powder under the ring and then uh, hit some gelatin in your mouth, but I mean, it's going to turn liquid right away with the second it hits your mouth and everybody's going to see it on your hands. I don't know. I really don't know. 
So that's 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 what makes it unique, and that's what makes Muda unique, and that's what makes Muda an innovator. And, and you know, they talk about Kabuki when when Muda first came out, didn't they want him to be the nephew of Kabuki? And Gary Hart said, no, let's make him the first Muda. That's that's what you know. Did the Undertaker need to be Andre's son like they tried to build uh, Big Show when he was the giant? No, he needed to be the first Undertaker. And that's why the Big Show's best work was when he was the Big Show and not the son of Andre the Giant. It's when you, you when you pioneer. We're talking about the great Muda, a pioneer. Truly, a truly. Technical wrestling pioneer, a a visionary, a man that that has done moves that nobody had ever seen, a man who put on wrestling clinics. It, you're never going to see another great Muda. Do you, you'll have imitators, but never originators after him. That's that's true to the ball, man. So, to recap, he debuts in the '80s. He rises to stardom by the early '90s. He becomes a legend in his own right by the mid 2000s. Continues to have great success all through the 10, 2010s, all the way up until this day. His success is being considered. Like I said, the best wrestler on the planet in two different eras, yes. before and after the injury. Absolutely. And, and it's on two different continents as well. Yes. Muto is one of only five wrestlers to win the three major championships of the Triple Crown Heavyweight Championship, yes. the New Japan IWGP Championship, and Noah's JC uh, Heavyweight Championship. Correct. He's also won the NWA title which makes yes. him a nine-time world champion. He's a 13-time world tag team champion, overall yes. holding 32 championships around the world. At the tender age of 46, Mudo slash Muda was a double champ with two different gimmicks, which is something that also has not been done before. Never, Never been done. Now, not as far as I know. Now, somebody might know something that I don't know. So if you know, let me know. Okay. Muda is, to me, he's what part of he's what's part of made me a wrestling fan. And you look at today's WWE product, and you look at your people that I call talent vacuums, like The Miz and Sheamus, and you're like, why do these guys still have a job when you had people like Muda? Oh, we're gonna and talk about that on the other side. <laughs> and so I look at like we have to say goodnight to the career of a man who had more talent than most people will ever think about. And you talk about like Rob Van Dam. Well, would we have Rob Van Dam if we didn't have Muda? Would we have Sabu if we didn't have Muda? Would we have the Hardys if we didn't have Muda? They didn't dream until you saw the great Muda on TV. You, they didn't dream until they saw that people could do this stuff. Now, has some promotions like AEW sometimes taken it too far with the people who want to do too many pop-ups and high spots? Of course. But did they tell the stories that the Great Muda did in the ring? No. Did they did they have ring psychology like the Great Muda? No. Do you think that I can believe that one of the young bucks would stand across from somebody and be an assassin? No. But the Great Muda? Absolutely. I, I, I look at – oh, shoot. I mean, Tajiri. Tajiri was small. He was very small. And sure, he was used somewhat in comedic roles, but he was the Japanese buzzsaw that you believed in it. And why? Because he was influenced by one of the greatest, and that was the great Muda. And it's, it's facts, people. Like – there are so many wrestlers that influence wrestlers today that, that, that you don't listen to or see or understand or know because you, you get brainwashed by Vince McMahon and his garbage BS. It's WWE and nothing else. And it's sad to say that, that this guy is going to be a ship passing in the night and no one's ever going to see his in-ring work because you didn't watch WCW or you didn't watch – international product you didn't see one of the best people to ever perform well the people in our circles will definitely if they didn't know about them before they will know about them now and i want everybody listening to 
go out there and do your homework and learn about this guy because it's truly heartbreaking if you were to go to your grave not knowing about this guy if you're a true passionate wrestling fan now i, I can't wholeheartedly <laughs> not agree i mean yeah well. so this guy like i said he did have his final match in february he's fully retired you know other legends that have retired recently we had undertaker retired in 2020 yeah. nature boy rick flair retired at 02 Triple H left his boots in the ring at WrestleMania. There's a long list of guys that are up for retirement. You know, we got Rey Mysterio rumored, or at least we think the last match would be at WrestleMania. Dustin Rhodes has already announced his retirement for this year, a.k.a. Gold Dust. Yep. Sting has announced his retirement for 2023 as well. Yep. We have Edge coming up with the retirement. The Hardy Boys. Yeah. Randy Orton's got a few years, maybe. I think John Cena's going to have his last match, presumably this year. Uh, you got unfortunate events like Adam Cole, who may have to retire due to head injuries. You know, guys like Rhino and Christian Cage, Tommy Dreamer, AJ Styles, R Truth, they're all right at, you know, at the finish line. You know, these are the guys that I grew up with knowing. But the future is bright. A lot of people on the rise. A lot of wrestlers on the rise. I can't wait. Some more guys are jumping ship to AEW. But I'm, the great... I, I want to see that. I want to see. I want to see the back and forth. I want to see like the old Monday Night Wars. Everybody, you know, who's going to surprise you? Who's going to do something different? I, I want to see that. I definitely. Well, do. we've seen enough of it in AEW with all the returning stars there from WWE. So now it's the other side of the seesaw is going to happen. Yeah. It's no, you're absolutely right, and 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 what I see right now, and what I want is like a better future for our wrestling, and we need more stars that will capture us, like the great Muda. How many people today do MJF? Absolutely. Um, anybody WWE built? Hmm. Can't say there's a whole lot. People will talk about people like. Montez Ford's the future. Guys, I got news for you. He is not. He's mid card champ. He's a mid card champ. I can see him have a solid, you know, mid card run. Uh, WWE Universal? Mm, no. I'm not sold on it. I'm not. Uh, Do do you see him going over Roman Reigns? No. No. Never. Absolutely not. I can't can't see him going over Kevin or, or Sammy or. Exactly. He's he's still in that tag team role, but again, we can talk all day. But exactly, we need to wrap it up. So why don't you all tell right, the bro. listeners about how Wrestle Magic is going to wrap up? That's different. Well, Wrestle Magic, we Wrestle Magic is our project. It's it's myself and Rocky T, and we're doing it through the WWE podcast, and we want it to be all about you folks. So we want to talk about the things that nobody else is talking about. So if you have an idea, we're all ears, and we will take in every idea. You can reach me at at 144Captain on Twitter, and um, basically you can tell me your ideas. I I don't want to do recaps. I don't want to – I mean unless it's a show that's really old or something like that. Rocky and I want to talk to you about what's on your brain and what's not – being talked about and this is this is our project so that's how you can reach me and um rocky what do you have in mind for our next show so before i give out that you know breaking news i can be reached at rocky's club 007 on twitter you might have heard it on the last episode of the mailbag there are instructions on there for the viewers who were not subscribed to Patreon yet. There's instructions on my Twitter page how to go ad-free on me. So check it out. Shoot me a little tweet. We'll do the back and forth, and I'll set you up with that. But going forward, there's talk about the landscape of our pay-per-views changing. Now, over the years, we've had many different pay-per-views, some that are being resurrected in NXT and some that we don't have anymore. And, of course, we have our, our big matches like the Elimination Chamber and Money in the Bank that have got their own pay-per-views now. So the next topic we're going to talk about is how pay-per-views have evolved, how they change the ones that, that touch us you know, dear. 
We're going to touch on the breaking records of those pay-per-views, the best matches, just the landscape of what we have today versus what we had in the Attitude Era, for example. So if anybody just wants to shoot me a little tweet about something that, you know, maybe stuck with you all these years, you do that, and we'll give you a little shout-out on the next show. Sounds like a plan, my man. Um, Also, folks, uh, I always like to sign off with telling you guys, do something for your fellow man. Do something great. Do something nice. People are are living a hard life. And, uh, you know, right before Rocky and I did this, uh, I showed him an image. I was on my way home, a bad car accident. And I I don't want to see that. I don't want people to hurt. I don't want people to be damaged or destroyed. Uh, it's weird because I'm a pro wrestling fan that you'd say it's oxymoronic, but at the end of the day, he's like, take care of someone for you. Take care of somebody who cares about you. Tell them you love them. Hug them. It means a lot. That's true. I tell my my kids I love them every day. I tell, you know, I call mom and brother, try to fa- FaceTime people. Sometimes a text and a call is a little, it feels a little detached. That FaceTime, you know, it really makes you feel more personal. So if you have the capability to FaceTime, do the FaceTime. Watch, if somebody doesn't live close to you, turn on FaceTime and watch wrestling together. Do the laptop. That's what I do with my brother. He, you know, he can watch wrestling on Peacock, but when I watch it here at home, I set this laptop right next to me and we watch it together because... I don't get to have those moments with him anymore where we we gear up all all, all month for the pay-per-view and you know when he used to live with me and we would do our cookouts and stuff so you know <laughs> spend time watching wrestling together. Um I got my son who's 8 and we're watching documentaries and you wouldn't believe that an 8-year-old in today's wrestling his favorite his all-time favorite wrestler is Kane. And I mentioned awesome. this one I mentioned this one time to Matt and he's like how does your 8-year-old kid become a fan of Kane? I'm like watching documentaries and you know he he loves undertaker and then he's like undertaker has a brother and just became he's infatuated with mask so <laughs> yeah that's awesome so just that's awesome show your kids wrestling show your family members wrestling it, it's for the family all right um you have anybody you want to shout out to um i just want to shout out to all the co-hosts on on this podcast um, I, I've I've really found a home with the mailbag that Matt does ever since he started it. I've been listening to his podcast already, you know, for about four years. And when he started the mailbag, it was a, an outlet for me to express, you know, my thoughts and my feelings and my rants and everything. Because I don't have a circle of friends in my daily life that are passionate as wrestling is about me. So when I found guys who love to talk about wrestling more than I did, I was just over the moon. So that's why I, I contribute. I believe in the podcast. That's why I advertise at the podcast. I advertise at the Rumble when I was there. I advertise on my social media. I even advertised when I was at the rodeo trying to sell phones to people. I showed this guy had on a 2020 Royal Rumble shirt, and I showed him the podcast. So awesome. just shout out to the co-host. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much it for now. Yeah, well, I'd like to throw some shout outs to uh, like anybody who's a fan of hearing my voice, which is kind of amazing because for almost 50 years old, I think I sound like an angry Muppet. Um, but I, I, I love everybody who listens to us. Uh, I love the fact that I want to shout out to you because you made this you, you helped make this possible with me. And um, of course, to Matt, because got to love him. You know, he's the one who says, go for it. Uh, Memphis Mark, because I've known him for 20 years. A guy named Nighthawk back in Memphis. I got your comic book. And, um, you know, to everybody in Louisville who might have lost power and everything else with our windstorms and everything else, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, just I just want to say that this is great and I love this. And let's just keep this up, brother. Let's have more wrestle magic. Looking forward to it. Kind of a little magician myself. So 
we'll have a lot of fun on the next topic. Maybe we'll bring somebody in for that because there's a lot to deep dive into those to these pay per views. Sounds like a fantastic plan, my man. All right, man. One more thing to all my heels out there, to all my bad guys. If you're gonna take a cheap shot, do it with class. <laughs> well, way to sign off, brother. All right, I'll catch you later. All right, bye. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.